Hello, I'm Robert Royal, and this is another in our series of podcasts sponsored by The Catholic Thing. The Catholic Thing is a daily column series at www.thecatholicthing.org, and you can subscribe for free by just clicking on that website and entering your email, and you will receive The Catholic Thing every morning at 6 a.m. We're happy to have with us today one of our collaborators from The Catholic Thing. We're, this is the, we're taping the Monday after Easter, and um, we are, are fortunate having with us James Matthew Wilson, who is a man of parts, as they used to say. He's a poet, he's a culture critic, he's an essayist, he's a professor. And James has just, um, his latest book of poetry has just been published by Word on Fire Books, and it's called, you will never forget this title, St. Thomas and the Forbidden Birds. So we're going to ask him to read that poem for us and to explain us, to us why that poem uh, was so important that it gave its name to this book. James, welcome to the Catholic Thing podcast. Thanks, Bob. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Uh, before we get into our literary matters, and I ought to say that Dana Joya, who is a, also a, a Catholic poet and is a former um, chairman of the National Endowment for the Arts, has said that, that James Matthew Wilson is the future of Catholic letters in America. No pressure on you, James. We just, we're just just looking to you. Give us a, a, just a, a brief sketch of who you are. You're, you're coming to us from Michigan today. You're from Michigan originally, I think. Um, just tell us a bit about uh, your life. Yeah, that's right. Um, so that I I don't I'm not entirely serious when I say this, but I always think of my two great themes as being uh, the Catholic Church and Michigan, which are not things that people always think of together. But um, but as 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 you know, Bob, I published years ago a long poem called "The River of the Immaculate Conception," mm -hmm. which is about America's Catholic roots including all of its Catholic origins from the, the Spanish conquest and the French Jesuit missions, as well as um, the conversion of Elizabeth Seton. Uh, and at the center of that poem is, uh, is a vision of America as a Catholic country that I got to, in a manner of speaking, experience growing up here in Michigan at St. Thomas Aquinas School, where we really thought of the terrain of Michigan as a place that had been first settled by the Indians and by the French who came to commune with them. And of course, we have lots of place names um, to, to demonstrate that. And I'm where I'm sitting talking to you right now, uh, I could just drive up the road to the place where Father Marquette uh, died 300 and something years ago. Yeah, I'm intrigued by the way that you've been able to interweave Catholicism and um, and the American experience. I think that's quite rare, and you bring it off. You're, I guess, what is sometimes called a formalist poet. So you, your your poems actually scan and they rhyme, and so they're in the, that grand tradition. But at the same time, I, th I'm, I think you're almost unique in bringing forward that kind of Catholic dimension. Although Dana obviously is, has been interested in the same thing as well. Dana covers Catholic California. I try to take the rest of the country. <laughs> <laughs> we appreciate that. So uh, why don't you read uh, St. Thomas and the Forbidden Birds for us, and then maybe you can tell us a bit about uh, what this unusual title means. Sure. So here's St. Thomas and the Forbidden Birds. And since you mentioned rhyme and meter, I'll just mention it's in heroic couplets, a form that many people will know from Alexander Pope and John Dryden, if not anyplace else. St. Thomas and the Forbidden Birds. Beyond the window, morning sparrows made their song as if the whole world's goodness paid its plenty out for them and them alone. The old saint heard their joy and squelched a moan as his legs, stiff and heavy still with sleep, arranged themselves beneath its cassocked heap of belly. Where had he left off before? He asked his three amanuenses more for their sake, sprightly fingers, sluggish minds than his. One said with the forbidden kinds of birds and what their figures signified for Moses who charged the eagle's flight with pride. Aquinas sat a moment, mind withdrawn from his mouth's taste of buttered loaves, the dawn without, the wish for more wood on the fire to clear the frost from stone or to admire the swift cool brilliance of all he said, as a swan plumes its white and well-turned head. He spoke. 
The long-beaked ibis feeds on snakes to represent the man whom nothing slakes. Feasting upon dead bodies open gore, the vulture stands for all who thrive through war. When Noah let the raven out to fly, it never did return to signify such men whose souls are blackened by foul lust, or who, unkind, won't pay back trust for trust. The plodding puffball ostrich is that which figures all those weighed down with growing rich, and hearing God's call plant their soiled head. Plovers like gossips on stray words are fed, and who, on seeing the gull, does not admire that its bright wings to heaven may aspire, and yet it wastes its hours adrift at sea, gorging on fishy sensuality. The hoopoe builds its nest on heaps of dung, just as despair's eyes view the world all wrong. He paused then at the thought of earthly sorrows, our sickly past, incarnadine tomorrows, the myriad things that whistle arcane truth to please old minds and to instruct raw youth and bore down on his broken knees to pray for such a world that had so much to say. Nice, thank you. So uh, what are we to, it's always hazardous to ask a poet, what does that mean? But I wanna ask you, because it, it's, it has some fun and also some seriousness in it. Um, yeah. Is this a, an actual thing? Did Thomas actually write about forbidden birds? Oh, it's so wonderful, Bob. So I was, I, I read, I sort of follow in the path of Flannery O'Connor and read a little Summa in the morning, not at night, but in the morning before I get down to my other work. And, um, and back in, I suppose it would have been the two, summer of 2017, I was in the treatise on the law. And here I am going through Aquinas's article on the mosaic, articles on the Mosaic Law, when I come across these wonderful figural and spiritual interpretations of why the Mosaic Law had forbid the consumption of certain kinds of birds. And I had heard from, you know, cranks and uh, people who don't appreciate the genius of Aquinas, that this kind of um, figural theology couldn't even be done by Aquinas in his scholastic system, which I always knew to be false, but here it was being proven false because Aquinas was absolutely inspired. And I thought, here's a moment also where the genius of the Summa gets united with that other wonderful kind of publishing that occurred in the Middle Ages, which was the medieval uh, bestiary with its account of all the different animals of the world and their habits. So the middle lines of this poem are simply my taking Aquinas' own words and putting them into rhymed verse. But then I framed it um, with, uh, with, of course, him sitting down, and he always recited for three amanuenses. He would be thinking about three different things, and his amanuenses would be copying down one thought each because he thought so quickly that it took three people to write down the thoughts that he could recite so swiftly. Um, and then, of course, the great genius of Aquinas is, is that um, is that for all of the sorrows and physical sufferings of this world, including in the Middle Ages, where just you know in the centuries after his death, that Europe would be wrecked by plague, Aquinas never struggled in his thought to see with clarity the goodness of being, and simply to pray for the woundedness of the world, and to um, and to point us in the direction of understanding the goodness of being. Yeah, that's yeah, certainly a lesson that we could afford to reproduce right now with all the troubles we're in in the church at, as well as in the world. Um, I, 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 want to, our, I want our listeners and our viewers to know a little bit more about the, the, the scope of the activities that you're involved with. Um, in particular, you're in, in, you've created this program, this uh, Master of Fine Arts MFA uh, program at the University of St. Thomas in Houston, mm -hmm. um, which is a way to teach others how to write, an important thing. And you've also been involved with Archbishop Corleone out in California with some of his uh, sort of aesthetic projects. Could you tell us a bit about those as well? Sure. Yeah, I, I, I never would have thought to have started a graduate program in this age where colleges are shutting down left and right, but it, it was uh, the most foolish and smartest <laughs> and ha happiest thing that I think I've ever done, aside from maybe marrying my wife. Um, because uh, 
we didn't know what was going to happen. Well, what happened was uh, dozens upon dozens of people began writing us to see if they could get a place in the program. And what we're succeeding in doing is revitalizing at an institutional level um, the literary life of the Catholic Church in the United States. We do have students from all over the world because we're an online program. So pe some people in Europe are getting up at two in the morning to join our seminars, which are all live proper classroom seminars. Um, and what, what we're seeing really quickly is people who had potential but just didn't even know where to look um, are suddenly producing new great short stories and novels and poems, especially poems in rhyme and meter, I'm pleased to say. So that's been uh, really exhilarating. It's been pure grace all the way through. And so has my involvement with the Benedict XVI Institute. I'm the poet in residence of that institute that Archbishop Cordelioni uh, founded years ago. And uh, I've been very honored to be able to write poems for them, including the River of the Immaculate Conception, and to be able to work with the composer Frank LaRocca to compose uh, poems that are then uh, set to music and become hymns um, for you know, dignified liturgical settings, but also commemorating specific moments in the church, including, you mentioned the troubles of the world. The last two projects I've done have been uh, a, a hymn, an offertory hymn for Ukraine that mentions all of the martyrs, uh, the Ukrainian martyrs from the 20th century. And then most recently, we've just completed um, stanzas for the Chinese martyrs, which uh, Frank has just finished setting to music. That will be premiering in May, I believe. Yeah, this is all great work. I mean, I'm, I'm very glad you're, you're doing that. We ought to tell, uh, just for the people who are watching or listening, that Frank LaRocque is the one who composed the Mass of the Americas, the famous Mass of the Americas, and I saw a beautiful performance of it. I think we were both there together at the um, the uh, National Shrine of the Immaculate Conception here in Washington. Um, can you just speculate a little bit? I mean, you put, you put a lot of energy and a lot of talent, I think, into this question of Catholic letters, Catholic Catholic literature. Why is that so important? I mean, I write I write about it fairly often, and I, I sometimes get pushback from people who otherwise like the things that we do with the Catholic thing or my own writing in particular, saying, "Yeah, but what does that matter? I mean, we've got so much troubles, so many troubles on the moral side, on the philosophical side. Um, what drives you, and, and, and what value do you think you, that the literary side, this this aesthetic side of Catholicism, brings to our current moment?" Well, it's, it's twofold. Uh, the first the first thing I would say is it's not that the Catholic Church needs literature, it's that literature needs the Catholic Church. The, the arts have always been one of the most profound ways in which people have uh, explored the human condition and especially its ordination to what transcends it. Uh, and there's a reason that suffering is so often the theme of literature going back to the Greeks. And that's because the mystery of suffering can only be explained at the cosmic level, at a level that goes beyond the, the actual feelings of, of this moment here and now, or this death here and now. So uh, without the Catholic vision, contemporary literature is deeply impoverished. And so that's the first uh, responsibility I think I have as a writer uh, is to, and, and as someone who's helping other writers to discover their vocation and their craft, is just to remind the world that for, lit for literature to be the great and meaningful force that it has been for millennia, it needs to do things that really only the Catholic Church can allow literature to do. It jams, the church jams open the gates to being so that we can't become small-minded ideologues, but remain open to the full scope of what is real. But then as you say, the church is mired in, in trouble, but uh, whether it's whether it comes to church doctrine or or politics, including the, you know, hard tack practical politics of elections, uh, human beings are not reducible to laws on the books, nor are they um, fully expressed or fully formed, even by their knowledge of doctrine. Culture is a real thing that shapes us. And uh, if someone's not going to help shape the culture so that it becomes worthy of human dignity and worthy of the truths that the church has to proclaim, to proclaim, people will be deaf, deaf, excuse me, deaf to that to that truth. So we have an immense responsibility, even though it's one we can only come at slantwise, because the last thing an artist should be doing when he's trying to write a poem is thinking about how this is going to, you know, help the reception of humanae vitae or something like that. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's an important thing. We we all talk about how uh, we have to evangelize the culture, but the culture in the meantime is inv- evangelizing a lot of us. And so we kind of have to purify the uh, the waters there. Mm-hmm. Um, we're getting a little short of time. You like to keep these podcasts short. Do you have another poem you'd like to read for us before we finish? Yeah, sure. So uh, because it's Easter, there are plenty of um, poems that deal with um, with the challenges of the present hour. But I wanted to share one that's consummately an Easter poem and one about spring. And in fact, you mentioned evangelizing the culture. And this is a poem that first appeared in Bishop Barron's Evangelization and Culture magazine. It's one called Seeds. We all have heard the parable of the sower. The man who goes out with his bag of seed and scatters it on path and stone and soil. How rare, we think, for work to come to fruit. The world about us hard and parched and stingy. We look at Malthus, upright in his pulpit, the flint of withered cheek and weathered brow, and almost wonder why it took so long for men to figure out the inner truth of things as parsimony and decay. The seeds themselves object to this, of course. The lilac seed that grew amid my maple, its gaudy purple blossoms bent beneath a canopy of broad tips spreading leaves, the two together tangled in their living. As if In generous revenge, a maple sapling has sprouted in our pink azalea, and wind has found out every hillside furrow to pack with dandelions who raise bright heads on stout necks in defiance of all doubt. They rustle with the cool air of the spring and give themselves away with silver plosions. But so does everything. The children racing around the plain field's new painted diamond, the hand moved by some vision to draw angels, The song escaped a passing car's cracked window that catches in a woman's ear, and though she's late for her appointment, starts her humming. A couple resting on a bench, their child asleep, the stroller rocking back and forth. All things declare their being and their goodness by going out beyond themselves, like seeds, their almost endless circle of new birth, much like the turn of planets and of stars that imitate the circle of their source. Beautiful, thank you. Well, our time is up now. Uh, As you know, I wrote a book about the Catholic intellectual tradition in the 20th century called A Deep Revision. I'm doing a sequel um, of that book now about the American Catholic intellectual tradition, which is a lot richer and and more varied than most people uh, understand. And you certainly, James, are a shining star in the firmament. And I'll keep, I hope we can all keep an eye on you as you continue to carry out this mission of, of being um, a proponent of Catholic letters in the United States of America. That's James Matthew Wilson again for all of you out there and his most recent book, St. Thomas and the Forbidden Birds, but also many other works as well. That's all we have time for today. And uh, l- let me just say to all of you, um, thanks to James Matthew Wilson. Thanks to all of you for being here. And we'll see you again very soon in this series of the Catholic Thing podcasts. <laughs>